I have the good fortune of being joined by the guy from Trade IX, as I now know it's pronounced. Uh, I'm here with David Sutter. David, nice to have you with us. Good to be here. Uh, and Danny Cotty. Danny, thank you so much for joining us. Thank uh, you. Gentlemen, David, maybe I'll start with you. Can you just give me a little bit about your background before you came to Trade IX and, and what it is you were doing and, and how you got interested in the subject? Yeah, absolutely. So I um, got into the trade finance space through a very non-traditional means, which was through Bitcoin. Uh, um, so I became a very big Bitcoin enthusiast as an undergraduate um, at university in the States. And that led me through a series of, of startups to um, where I am now. I've spent the last, uh, well, my entire adult life helping design and implement uh, next generation trade finance platforms and networks utilizing distributed ledger technology or blockchain. Um, so it's pretty amazing. Yep. Uh, and Danny, uh, I think storied career, storied history that you, you've had. Yeah, so I'm an ex banker, career banker. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, over 30 years, worked in uh, large international banks, Citibank, uh, ABN AMRO, RBS, JP Morgan, and run global trade finance businesses and, and, and loan businesses and payments businesses. So you've taken the best of the enthusiasm and the best of the banking knowledge and crushed the exactly. two together. It that, can be in perfect harmony. See, it can be done. I'm a believer in convergence, guys. I'm a believer you can have both. So I'm curious about then uh, how TradeIX came together. What was the, the genesis story? The Genesis story is really uh, our CEO and co-founder, Rob Barnes. Uh, Rob uh, has been already the co-founder of Prime Revenue, one of the most successful su supply chain finance platforms that are out there and still operating today. And uh, when he got involved or when he got exposed to blockchain, he got the bug like many others. Mm -hmm. And, oh, and uh, came to the conclusion together with his former colleagues that there must be a better way of uh, executing trade finance. And that's basically the way it started. And he started putting a team together. And we founded uh, Trade IX about a year ago at the end of 2016. Uh, and uh, here we are, up, live, running in the, in the public and interviewing with you. Uh, live and running. I like the sound of that in the whole blockchain and DLT space where there's, let's face it, a lot of white papers flying around at the moment. A lot of vaporware. Uh, a lot of vapor white papers as well. Uh, so let's, let's talk about the problem that you guys were set up to solve. What is the problem in trade finance? I'll, I'll just give me a flavor of some of the problems. Maybe, yeah, maybe so, David, David um, can say that. Well, trade finance is an $8 trillion a year industry. It's one of the most economically important sectors of financial services broadly. Um, and despite its importance and size, the financial and IT systems that support the market today are some of the most antiquated, siloed, disconnected, manual paper-based systems we have in, in financial services. So this is every time you buy anything in a supermarket, every time you buy any good, everything you touch probably around you has come through some sort of trade supply chain somewhere. Absolutely. And there's a total lack of interoperability and in standards, uh, a, a real lack of automation, a real lack of transparency and security uh, in the data that, that financial institutions are, are making lending decisions based on. Um, and there's a lot of, a lot of data silos that, that have created a lot of friction and risk in the market. And that, that leads to a very poor client experience. It feels to me like everybody's looking at their feet. Um, you know, everybody can see their own little world, but they can't see what's going on in the rest of the world. And actually, if you could, you can make a lot better decisions. It's almost uh, like look up, guys, and, and you can see what's happening. If I could see uh, how my supplier was doing and how their harvests were going, if I was looking to buy fresh goods from them, I could probably help them with financing. I could probably make decisions about what I can sell and what I can't sell. I could make different Different decisions if I have that data. But why is that interoperability so hard? And, and why, why on earth does DLT begin to solve that? Well, so I think that um, there is two things that's happening right now, why DLT is solving it. One, if you look at the characteristics of trade, um, and you, you have hundreds of thousands of different counterparties, a lot of different assets and data that you need to securely track and make visible to those hundreds of thousands of different counterparties. Um, you have a high need for automation, a high need for digitization. And if you start kind of compiling the characteristics of trade, and then you look to what a distributed ledger does and its characteristics and what it does well, the two align very nicely. So the technology has, has really also driven an intellectual spark. So it's a good technological fit for the problems that the industry is facing. But m almost more importantly, 
Uh, as you know, that distributed ledger has driven a change in thinking for the large financial institutions and, and big players in, in finance to become more collaborative and more open um, about the financial systems that they're looking to build for the future. So DLT is is provided the tools, but also become an intellectual spark to get people together, sitting around the, tab- the table together and, and, and talking about how they can collaborate and be more open. But couldn't they have had this spark? I mean, Danny, you've been around for a while. You've seen a lot of initiatives in in trade where people have tried to solve this problem before. What's different now? Because I'm sure there's there's definitely a more desire, as, as, as David says, but is there something else here that's going on, do you think? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I have started my uh, uh, career life uh, writing on a typewriter, pre PC time, uh-huh. where the dog, and 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 that illustrates uh, the problem that every company, no matter what industry in or what service they provide or what products they uh, are requested, either by their regulators or, or by their jurisdictional uh, system, to keep their own ledger and create the document. In today's world, every document is issued electronically. Nobody is using typewriters anymore. Nobody is writing uh, writing handwriting documents. They're all issued electronically, but then they go STP. They go straight to printer (laughs) and and become a manual document, hand it over to the next party, and then the next party keys it in again, and then again, STP, straight to the printer to hand it on on to the next party. It's really odd that I get a piece of paper, (coughs) then I key it into a digital system so that I can print it again. It just seems like this weird little industry. So there must be a better way to do this, right? There has to be a better way. (laughs) And, and, and this is where DLT comes in, right? To create a distributed ledger accessible to all. But so why the, couldn't those systems talk to each other before? Why couldn't all of those computers that were centralized systems, the mainframes, what was the problem there? Security, firewalls, privacy, uh, all, all aspects that matter. You so know, it, was, that, it was just hard to do? Was, was it's that- very hard to do. Different systems, different computer languages, uh, and uh, to, to create host-to-host connectivity is a rather complex scenario. And I think the distributed ledger gives the opportunity to create an irrefutable source of truth of a transaction that is accessible to everybody. But it requires the legal system around it to, to accept that single ledger as the truth ledger. So at the moment, we are in this interim phase. So we have this technology that uh, really can show us the way for the future, but the technology is not fully deployed yet. So while we write things to the blockchain and use the blockchain as, uh, as a source of truth, companies still have to keep their own records. Mm-hmm. So they have to have their own source of truth. And there's also this other source of truth. So we're in this kind of 1.5 version of the world in which you've got to have all of your old infrastructure and all of your own cost. The future's there and you can run that too. But until the uh, legislation and regulation catches up with the technology, you've kind of got to be thinking about, well, actually, how should I be talking to my regulators? How should I be talking to my governments and helping them understand the benefits to the wider economy? And we've seen that in Hong Kong and Singapore and, and and, and that whole sector of the world seems to have been quite aggressive. I think you've been involved in some initiatives out that way. Yeah, so the um, the entire trade finance industry, um, as highlighted by uh, Singapore's initiatives there that are government-sponsored for the creation of a national trade platform, as well as in Hong Kong um, and other jurisdictions, the entire trade finance industry is really pouring a lot of time, money, and resources into the deployment of distributed ledger across uh, a variety of different trade finance products, services, and offerings. Because like us, many financial institutions, large corporates, technology providers believe that um, it is really fit for purpose to serve as the new technical backbone for a much more connected, open, inclusive technology infrastructure purpose built for trade. So so the regulatory discussion, the legal discussion is catching up to where the technology is. But until it does, it's somewhat of a, it, it has not yet and will not realize its full potential. So talk to me about uh, what my experience has been like from say, like, let's say I was a bank and I used to be, I used to have the buyer on one side, the seller on the other side, or, or another bank with the, the seller on the other side. I was lending into that supply chain. I was providing some liquidity so that people could finance that transaction so that they didn't have so they had the working capital so that they could continue to run their operations but they could also uh, have some degree of uh, kind of trust that that transaction would go through with a with 
a buyer or seller that they'd never met before. They were doing all of that in paper. They had people checking the paper and keying it in, as, as you said, Danny. What's different now in that process? And what are, what are the benefits of, of those differences? Yeah, so what's different now is uh, those processes, The let's take supply chain finance, for example, uh, are entirely siloed and, and specific to the destination application and silo that's serving that supply chain. So let's say you have a buyer and 5,000 suppliers and one bank or one or two banks is providing liquidity and financing that supply chain. That is an entirely siloed uh, program where suppliers that have other buyers and other supply chain finance programs have to use a multitude of different portals to access each different silo. Right. So everybody's looking at everybody else. It's almost you've got this hub and spokes model for each for each actor in that system. I'm looking at different banks or for each supplier, I'm looking at different buyers. For each buyer, I'm looking at different suppliers. Everybody's looking at lots of different people. Everybody's got lots of different portals they need to use. So you've just got the spider's web. Exactly. So suppliers will end up in situations where we're looking at 20, 30. We talked to a company that's using 50 different supply chain finance portals and having to do manual entry on each one of those and manual decision making about complex financial decisions on each one of those. And it becomes an absolute nightmare. Can you imagine having that job of trying to use 50 different portals and 50 different systems? I mean, you can see why people in this industry have been tearing their hair out for some time. Yeah, they're definitely gray haired. <laughs> <laughs> looking at looking at Danny over there. Uh, <laughs> uh, but Danny, so talk to me about where we go next. Like, if if we need to uh, allow the um, regulation and legislation to catch up, what's going to be what drives that, and, and what have you guys been up to specifically? Yeah, so uh, I think you need an open infrastructure, uh, and that's easier said than done. Yeah, what do you mean and by an open infrastructure? Open infrastructure is that it's really shared access to the data. Right. And that's what we are. We are unique in the trade finance space that our platform and uh, with our partnership that we have with R3, leveraging the Corda uh, infrastructure, DLT infrastructure, uh, specifically purpose-built for financial services, uh, gives us that open, that open character. So that's one differentiation that we have. The second differentiation is, like I said before, we are live. We have actually done an end-to-end -end invoice financing and recorded it on the blockchain with a series of uh, counterparties that is in the public's uh, domain. It's a large logistic uh, uh, provider, uh, AIG as a trade credit insurer and Standard Charter Bank as the funder, and, and we are the platform provider. And then thirdly, we have this unique experience of, uh, uh, of having technology and business expertise and subject matter expertise also on DLT. So these three things together really make, make, make us unique. And uh, the danger that you have at the moment is a lot of these national platforms emerging, a lot of new business network emerging, and they do the same thing as in the past. They replicate silos. They impose their own standards or want to impose their own standards. And instead of company silos, we have no business network or national trade platform silos. So, so one, it's not solving the problem. One professional uh, from uh, Capital Markets once said to me, we will risk recreating the maze. Um, okay. So we move from having a silo in each company to a silo right. in each country, which isn't a lot better. It may be a bit better for people in that country and for some trade routes. But then how do we do that? Because there are a lot of uh, open initiatives Initiatives. We had um, the guys from Sweetbridge on a couple of episodes ago, for instance. Um, there are a lot of different answers to, to how you do that. What, what's your approach for how that platform becomes more open? So from a logistical and operational perspective, it's important to start with a core group of strategic players that have uh, geographic reach. So looking at financial institutions that have very large pre-existing client networks um, in strategic trade zones around the world and, and beginning with them and focusing on the creation of a very solid, robust platform that has clear value propositions for their clients. So you need to get that done first before you can sort of blow the doors open and open up to the entire world. Um, but if you have that solid foundation and you're really providing real client value, you're going to continue to attract more and more strategic players that 
each one of them represents a network in so, and of so themselves. So you guys are really starting at the top of the market with yeah. the big trade routes, with the big suppliers, the big buyers, the big finances uh, and insurers and so on. Because there are initiatives like, for example, Digital Trade Chain and others that are starting at the bottom of the market. Is there a point at which we see those start to converge, do you believe? Um, and this is speculation, I guess, on, on my part. But do you think that uh, the let many flowers bloom thing and that things are going to change in the next few years? Or do you think the, you know, the thinking has now been done and there, there may be a winner out there? Yeah, no, I think absolutely that um, we're going to see these initiatives conser- uh, converge. Um, if we don't, then we've just spent a lot of time and money recreating the same problems we set out to solve, which is the elimination of data silos and the friction and risk that those cause within trade. So you're going to see a variety of different initiatives focused on different market segments, different clients, different parts of the world, different financing products within trade. Uh, ultimately, I, I, having spoken to pretty much all of them, they're all open and understand that this is a serious risk and are willing to address it as their individual business network matures to the point where they're ready to enable connectivity. Which leads me on to my next question. Well, where do you think we're at in the, the timeline and, and what happens next? And, and the second part of that question is, and what are going to be the, the challenges and the hurdles, do you think? We are still at the beginning of this journey. So uh, I, I would say personally that we, we are right in the first quarter of this journey. Uh, in, as these various networks emerge uh, and, and everybody learns more how to, to, to work with the technology and, and how to use it uh, in, 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 in the right fashion. And uh, that's why uh, our partnership with R3, we, we have this uh, uh, Marco Polo initiative with 20 leading banks where on an open uh, infrastructure, we, we, we start with invoice financing, and it's a starting point. Our vision is much, much broader than that. Our vision is to include uh, uh, many more banks. Our vision is to include many corporates, large ones, uh, directly uh, on, on this network. Our vision is to include uh, a lot of shared service providers that are out there that help executing the, the trade finance so there's lots more to be done over the next years. Do you risk alienating small businesses uh, in, in that process, or do you think that at some way along the line there's a way to include them too? Not at all. There is a way to include them totally and, and much easier than they are included at, uh, at, at the moment. And, and I think what, what we are thinking as well uh, is, is how can we connect these various platforms as they emerge? That's very interesting. Well, so if I was a trade finance professional, just somebody curious about this subject, where would I go to learn more about you and, and where would I go generally? What would be your top tips? Yeah, so I would. you can start by visiting our website, uh, www.tradeix.com. And there's a news section on there and about section where you can read around and, and uh, see what's going on with our company for more broadly. Um, I'm a big fan of, of just going to Google and typing in uh, what you're looking for and, and just go search distributed ledger technology, trade finance, blockchain trade finance, and you will find a plethora of information and initiatives out there. And uh, I think it's important for all trade finance practitioners to go do so and, and understand that their industry is, is starting to shift uh, under their feet and, and undergo a, a broad rewiring, as we like to say, of the actual very infrastructure upon which these services and, and products run and are offered. That's a really interesting point. And uh, the let me Google that for you reference is much appreciated. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being on Blockchain Insider. Thank you very much. You're welcome.